Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the call that you have placed in our lives, just as you called those uh, 12 men 2,000 years ago to follow you and the many others who have followed you since. Um, God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the call in our lives and that call to discipleship, uh, to follow you, to take up our cross. Um, and so, Lord, I pray that you help us now as we gain a deeper and fuller understanding of what it means to be your disciple, uh, to be living as Easter Christians uh, in our day and age. So, Lord, we pray for your wisdom and for your guidance. Amen and amen. Well, like I said, we are continuing in a new sort of a mini-series or an Easter series uh, on uh, what it means to live as an Easter Christian. Again, we celebrated Easter a few weeks ago. So what, what does that mean? So what? Why? What impact does that have in our lives? And thankfully, the Bible uh, tells us that. Uh, so we're going to be surveying uh, different passages on, on what it means to be, to live as a Christian. Uh, that resurrection event, that Christ event, uh, that conversion event, uh, in, in perhaps in your own life, uh, that coming to know Christ, that was a spark of something, uh, of, a, of a chain reaction, if you will. Uh, and so it's important for us to look at the Bible to understand, okay, what are the different links in that chain reaction? So this morning, I'm going to be reading from Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read to you from verses 19 through 26. Uh, listen now to the word of God. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Of course, this section, when we read it, perhaps you even knew it when we came across the verse, a very familiar, well-known uh, section on the fruit of the Spirit. Um, so this is part two in our uh, mini-series, and here the Apostle Paul is addressing the church in Galatia. Um, he's uh, concerned for them. He has some grave concern for them. Earlier in chapter 3, he, he asked them, who has bewitched you? Um, what, what, what type of foolishness has come upon you? Um, a little later on in chapter 5, earlier in this passage, he asked, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Um, so it's very clear that Paul it has some some concerns for the church in Galatia. There were some errors that were uh, popping up, coming in, uh, arising, perhaps or, or certainly because of at least one, but maybe multiple false teachers, false uh, uh, pastors who were misleading and misinterpreting the scriptures. Um, the errors that were, you can look, if you look through Galatia, the story, the book of Galatians, you'll find that... Um, there's a, one error is the reliance on self-righteousness. Paul's going to call out these um, Judaizers who want, uh, want the Christians to, to think that they can earn God's salvation. Uh, that's self-righteousness. Um, so that's one concern that Paul addresses. Uh, another is the prevalence of sin, which is our section uh, this morning. Uh, Paul sees that there is, um, that there is a, an un... A, an un unnecessary and perhaps even uh, unhealthy uh, looking at, relying on, and uh, perhaps even stressing the, the sins that are, or excuse me, the unmortifying, not mortifying the sins that are in the lives of individuals. Of course, Paul speaks very heavily on the importance of mortifying sin, especially in the book of Romans. 
Of course, reliance on self-righteousness and the prevalence of sin go hand in hand. Uh, and of course, we can see throughout the ages, perhaps even in our own day and age, how self-righteousness, this idea of self-aggrandizement, this idea that uh, I can do it myself, often leads to sinning. And so the apostle wants to address these errors, and the way he does it, specifically the error of the prevalence of sin, but I would also argue the reliance on self-righteousness, is he culminates in this section on a, drawing a distinction between flesh and spirit. And so that's where we're jumping in on the conversation. Um, if you look at the context of Galatians chapter 5, you'll see that flesh and sp versus spirit, this debate is actually about Christian liberty, Christian liberty. Uh, this is a major topic for the Apostle Paul. He'll, he'll really flesh it out in, uh, in 1 Corinthians and in Romans, uh, but at, obviously if it's appearing in multiple books of the Bible, it's clearly an important um, and something that pops up in the early church, that there is first a misunderstanding of what it means to be freed in Christ, and so therefore there is a right way to know what it means to be freed in Christ. And of course, very simply, and you've heard me say it before, we are free from sin, but we're not free to sin. And that's going to be Paul's main concern in the letter uh, to the Corinthians. Um, we cannot, especially in this section, uh, what Galatians 5 is teaching us, is that we are not free to ignore the command, love thy neighbor. Um, that's important especially your neighbor in Christ. Um, that's, the, that's essentially the summary of verses 16 and 17 in Galatians chapter 5. So it seems that the people in Galatia, the, 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 these Christians who are sitting in the churches, uh, worshiping God with one voice, are with another somehow ignoring the command to love thy neighbor. They're not loving uh, their neighbor, especially their brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Paul then says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So he's going to transition into the, the juxtaposing the flesh and the Spirit. And I just want to comment on that phrase, not under the law. It doesn't mean that you're, excuse me, it does mean that you're no longer under the condemnation of the law. We're no longer under the condemning weight of the law because... Christ has redeemed us. Christ has covered that guilt plea, or that, excuse me, that guilty sentence for us. That's important because that's what Easter does. What Jesus does on the cross, what Jesus does by sacrificing himself for our sins is this in verse 18, that there is no condemnation under the law, or you know, as Paul will say in Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, again, just because we are not under the weight of the law, not under the, the condemnation of the law, does not mean that there are no laws for Christians. See, that's the sticky part. People often talk, and I've heard this from Baptists, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, Methodists, all across the board. There's this idea, an, an erroneous idea, that in Christ, all you have to do is have a relationship with Jesus, and that's it. And to one extent, yes, you only need to have Christ in your heart in order to be redeemed. You don't earn salvation. But having Christ in your heart doesn't mean you are then free to continue in lawlessness. That's the problem that Paul sees is going on in the church. The commands that Jesus gives to us, the commands of the New Testament, even the Ten Commandments, which are in the Old Testament, these commands, again, are not salvific, but think of it like this. These commands are like a father's instruction to a son, okay? Think about this analogy for a second. I personally don't really care if someone else's kid doesn't listen to me. You know, I, I can't go up to your children and say, you know, go clean my room or go clean your room, go wash my car, go cut the grass. I don't have that authority over your children. I do care whether my children listen to me. 
And remember, this is the important thing. We are God's children. Those who are not God's children, or as uh, Jesus says when he's having a conversation with the Pharisees, those who are your father, which is Satan, so the children of Satan, God doesn't give these commands to them. God does give these commands, these instructions to his own children, those who are adopted by grace, and God expects, just like every other good parent, would expect his children to listen to his instruction. Not to earn anything. My children don't earn more love because they do things. Or they don't disearn or, or they don't lose my love because they don't do things. I love my children because they're my children. You love your children because they're your children. God loves his children because they are his children. That love doesn't change. God doesn't love us more or less based on the commands. But God does expect from his children a certain level of trust and obedience. Just like I have an expectation of a certain level of trust and obedience for my own children, as I hope you for yours. So before I'm packing this list, I, I, I want to discuss very briefly the groupings that Paul has here. He says there's the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. So I want to talk about those two words, deeds and fruit. The deeds, or perhaps your translation might say the works of uh, the flesh, this, the Greek word has this idea that it's anything that's accomplished by your hands. Um, so a craft or an industry on which you set your mind to do. Um, so you set your mind to do something and you can craft it. You can create it, be industrious in that manner. And so the deeds of the flesh or the works of the flesh are those things which our natural sinful self will set our minds to do. And it doesn't take a lot of convincing for my mind to want to do something that is selfish. It doesn't take a lot of convincing for my mind to set on itself to do something simple. It's very easy to fall into temptation. How many times have we stumbled into temptation? A simple glance, a small word, a little something, a little something else. It's harder to look temptation in the face and say, no, I will not do it. And so our natural sinful self, especially if we are without Christ or before we came into Christ, our natural sinful mind will set itself to do something. And the things that it does are these deeds of the flesh, which is why Paul says that they are made evident. That Greek word made evident is quite simply this idea of manifesting. Our sinful thoughts, our sinful desires will manifest in the deeds of the flesh. The opposite of that are the fruit. Here, this Greek word is quite simply just the word fruit. It's anything that comes from something. So anything that comes from something. A harvest, using that fruit language, or an effect Something, a chain reaction, if you will, an effect. So that's this idea of the fruit, something that comes from something else. And so the fruit of the Spirit that Paul lists here, it's singular. It is one fruit. So it's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's a singular result from the labor of one person. And I'll give you one guess who that person is. If you say it to yourself, you're wrong, because it is the Spirit. It is the fruit of the Spirit. So it's the result of the labor of the Spirit in the lives of the redeemed. So notice who the two actors in these deeds and fruit. Our natural self will do the works, the deeds of sinfulness, the deeds of the flesh. And it's the Spirit working in us to produce the fruit of the Spirit. So that's the important key distinction, understanding who is doing the work here. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives in order to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Without the Spirit in our lives, or to say another way, if we are not Christians, 
If we have not been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we will not produce the fruit of the Spirit, but we will indeed produce the deeds of the flesh. So now Paul jumps into them. In verses uh, 19 through 21, he lists 15 uh, deeds of the flesh that are natural to fallen, fallen men. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. Don't think that this is the only, uh, this is the short list. This is not. This is just a, a sampling. Um, there's much more on here that we could, uh, we could certainly add. And certainly if you compile all of the list printed in the scriptures, you'll see it's uh, quite long. The first of these deeds of the flesh is uh, immorality. It's the Greek word porneia. So that tells me it's talking specifically about sexual immorality. This is the type of immorality. It's an umbrella term. It's a term that means all forms of sexual thoughts, all forms of sexual activity, all forms of, of sex that are outside the design of God's design for sex is sexual morality. All of it. When it is outside of the bonds of of marriage, of one man and one woman cleaving together in holy matrimony. If sexual activity happens outside of that, it is immoral. It's a blanket term, an umbrella term. The second word he says is impurity. This idea is the, of moral uncleanliness, moral uncleanliness. So oftentimes we think of, you, know, you might say the word impurity. Another word that I've used is the word unmixed. It's related to that, but this word, this Greek word literally means moral uncleanliness, to be unclean. What does Jesus himself say to us? It is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes forth from the heart. That's the idea of here of this moral uncleanliness, this impurity. Or another way to say it is impurity of heart. That's the second deed of the flesh. The next is sensuality. This idea of unbridled, of, 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 unsh of shameless lust and excess. That, that there's no care at all about how much of whatever I want, whether that lust be, again, sexual, whether that lust be uh, financial, whether that lust be power, it doesn't matter, where there is an unbridled, shameless sense of excess. The more I get, the more I want. The more power, the more respect, the more money, the more sex, the more whatever. Of course, we see, I would call today, I might, re I might replace the word sensuality with the word materialism today. How many people out in the world want more of something? There's a reason why, I'll just use Apple as an, ex as an example, why they're constantly pumping out a new iPhone every year. It's ridiculous. There's no need for an iPhone 13, an iPhone 15. They keep going and go, why are they doing it? Well, there are people out there who want the next best thing, who want more, who want what's novel. That is what is natural to us, an unbridled, shameless lust and excess. Idolatry. We often think of an idolatry, of course, in the first century and, and earlier of having, you know, this golden idol or this wooden idol, something that you keep on your mantle place and you worship. And, and, and certainly that is the word that perhaps was coming to the mind or the image that was coming to the mind of the people in Galatia. This is a pagan community, a Roman community, a community that had household deities. Today, we don't often think that way. We don't have little gods that we worship necessarily. So what is idolatry in our time? Well, quite simply, what you do when a person is worshiping an idol, they are holding in holy honor something or someone other than God. Now, that may be a deity, some sort of person that, that or something or creature which you might worship and pray to, 
But in our day and age, it's anything that you might hold in holy honor. Something that God should be the focus of, but we've replaced God and put something up else up there. Our work, our money, our power, our family, our community, whatever, whatever, whatever. Whatever we've replaced God with is our idol. And we need to be careful what we are holding in holy honor. Sorcery, again, this too, we might think of um, you know, things like divination and witchcraft and uh, necromancy and things like that. And, and certainly that, again, was, was probably what was coming to mind in the first century. Uh, I can think of uh, the story of, of King Saul going to the witch of Endor uh, so that she will, will summon Samuel so that uh, he could speak with, um, with his dead prophet. Certainly that is a, a, a form of that. Now, of course, we don't see that happening now in this day and age. I will say there are, quote-unquote, witches in the town of Alta Vista. And they are, they are casting spells and curses and, you know, so-so. So certainly you could lump that in there. Quite simply, what sorcery is are the, the magical arts that are fostered by idolatry. So, again, in the first century... A person who would be a sorcerer or trying to do sorcery things is trying to do something for a deity or on behalf of a, of a deity. Um, you know, uh, it was uh, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus the king, who went to the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi is not a god, but a, a sorcerer. And when, you know, if you read the story, you know what happens. But there's this idea of, of this is a thing, a person that you would go to to give you information, usually information from the divine world. That's why God actually condemns necromancy and these sorcery, things like that, because what this does is it's trying to peer into the mind of God. That's not a place that we are called or invited to look into. If we want to know what's in God's mind, we read this, because this is God's revealed will to us. Anything beyond this is sorcery. And so when we think about these magical arts fostered by idolatry, perhaps I would put in there instead of, again, uh, this notion of worshiping a deity, but perhaps worshiping or replacing God with something else, I would say that all, this sorcery is anything that channels our honor away from God. So anything that channels our honor away from God, that would be sorcery. If it's moving us to not honor God, but honor something else, whatever that thing is, I would call, or I would lump under sorcery. I might not call it sorcery, but I would lump it under what Paul is talking about here. He lists several more uh, after this. I'm going to clump them together. Um, hostility and contention. Specifically, hostility and contention as a result of selfish, self-righteous, Bullheaded indignation. So enmities, strife, this idea of jealousy. You know, jealousy here, it's not so much of, of um, me being jealous of your car or your house or your station or whatever. This is the idea of selfish, arrogant indignation. Again, and that produces this hostility. This produces contention within the church. And Paul condemns it. Oftentimes, this, again, hostility and contention from bullheaded indignation takes on the form of unfettered and uncontrollable anger. He says it right there. Outbursts of anger. That's a deed of the flesh. Uncontrollable anger. Factitiousness. Unnecessary and unhealthy division. And outright heresy. So again, these words here outburst of anger when we allow again hostility contention indignation when we allow those things to enter into our hearts we often will cause an outburst we pent it up for so long we haven't taken it to the lord we don't cast our anxieties on god who cares for us and instead we well it up and suddenly it comes out in un 
uncontrollable anger. Which that anger often creates factions, factitiousness, disputes. These unnecessary and unhealthy divisions. Again, dissensions. And then it's outright heresy. That's what that last word faction is. It's actually the Greek word hieresis, which is where we get the word heresy. So oftentimes we think of heresy as some sort of theological dispute, but you know what? Causing division in a church is heresy. Carrying on the unwholesome burden of ill will and spite. That's what's carried by this word envying. Carrying on the unwholesome burden of ill will or spite towards someone. Again, oftentimes we think of envying as something saying, well, I, I wish I had what that person had, or the grass is always greener on the other side. But no, this idea is carrying ill will towards another, being spiteful towards a, another. Drunkenness, carousing. Why, why do people get drunk? What's one of the, some of the main reasons why people get drunk? Well, there's two I can think of, probably more. Usually there's some sort of relief from the struggles and the cares of the world. And I'll add in this drunkenness, not just drunkenness by alcohol, but any source of substance abuse. Any source of using something as a, as a way to relief, or as a form of relief from the struggles and the cares of this world. And then another reason why, again, this is word carousing, is release to indulge in letting loose to revel in. I see that a lot on college campuses. Oh, here, just take this shot. Loosen up a little bit. You'll be fine. So that you can carouse, revel. And then Paul ends, and things like these. That's how I know this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a sampling of the deeds of the flesh. These things, these 15 that he mentioned, and things like these things, of which he himself has forewarned them about. So that tells me he's preached about it to them before, and he now feels the need that he needs to repeat it to them because they weren't listening the first time. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he has to forewarn them about, that he has forewarned them once before. Recall, we talked about last week from the book of Hebrews, how that all, the apostle warns against us willful sinning. And what happens when we sin willfully is we're trampling underfoot the Son of God. Well, likewise, our practice or our exercise, this idea of, of committing ourselves to, practicing, lifting our, our, our weights of sinful desire, when we practice these things, such action will not inherit the kingdom of God. Or, to put it a little bit differently, God will not give his children the desire nor the license to do these things. Now, I talked about God our Father and what he does, the instructions he gives to his children. Not the children of Satan, but to his children. God will never give his children a desire to continue on sinning willfully, nor the license to continue on sinning willfully. God will not do that. Because as Jesus says, we are to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 6. God will give to his children, turn to the next verse, the fruit of the Spirit. And so what God does is he sows into his own both the will and the way to bear the Spirit's fruit. God gives us the, the willpower, no longer desiring the sinful fleshly things, but the will to do that which is of God and the way to do it. He empowers us to do it. So Paul juxtaposes the deeds of the, and the fruit, and so I'm going to as well. And I'll go through these ones pretty quickly because they're, 
We all know them, by and large. And so I want to show them in juxtaposition or as counterpoints to what he just listed in the deeds of the flesh. First is love. Love does not find fulfillment in sexual immorality or moral impurity. Love, true, godly, Christian love, does not find enjoyment, does not find its desire, does not find its fulfillment in sexual immorality or moral impurity, the desires of an impure heart. Godly love does not love those things. Joy. Joy does not rejoice in unbridled sensuality or find fulfillment in anything other than God. Westminster Confession. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Joy. If we're to enjoy God forever as we confess, then we cannot, must not, God will not allow us to rejoice in unbridled sensuality or find fulfillment in anything other than God. We will not be idolatrous. Joy is not idolatrous. Peace. Peace does not set itself against another. Peace knows that two wrongs never make a right. Peace knows that it comes to us from God our Father. Peace knows who's the prince of peace. Peace does not set itself against another. Related to that is patience. Patience does not avenge wrongs, but rather it seeks forgiveness, knowing that the path to peace, the only way to reach peace is to trot it with forbearance or patience, long suffering. Peace, excuse me, patience will lead us to peace. Kindness, kindness does not give way to the wrathful passions, those outbursts of anger. Kindness strives to maintain integrity and moral goodness. That's what that word kindness means. It's not just being polite. I can be polite, but be morally bad. No, what this is talking about is moral goodness, that which God finds pleasing. Related to that is the word goodness. And goodness does not heed to self-righteousness and a selfish call. This word goodness is this idea of maintaining an uprightness of heart. So again, there are a lot of bad people who might do good things. There's a lot of unsaved people who are going to hell or are, are, are in hell who did good things. Good things is not what we're talking about here. We're talking specifically about an uprightness of heart that reflects the new creation we have in Christ. That's the idea of goodness. And then faithfulness. Faithfulness does not divide. Faithfulness does not bring dissension or heresy, but remains steadfast to the promises and the calling of God, trusting in Him. Gentleness, verse 23, does not carry on in unwholesomeness, but carries a disposition of humility and respect. And self-control, it does not let the situation or our emotions take the lead, but keeps a soberness that is even keeled in the face of both trial and temptation. These are the fruit of the Spirit. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus, those who claim to be his followers and servants, those who are the adopted sons and daughters of God, they have, as Paul says in verse 24, crucified the flesh and all of its deeds, all 15 and more of those. 
Those deeds have been and are nailed with Christ. The desires, the passions to do the deeds of the flesh have been mounted onto that tree with our Savior. And so if we are in Christ, if we live by the Spirit, then we are called to walk by the Spirit. If our flesh with its desires and deeds is nailed to the cross, if we know that that's a reality, if that is something that is true for every regenerated Christian, for every true believer, then we should not be entertaining or exercising immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Stop it. Cease and desist is what the Apostle Paul is telling us. That should not be in your heart. For to continue on in such things, Paul will say at the end of this chapter, verse 26, to continue on in such things is arrogant. Or the word he uses is boastful. Because if we continue in those things, if you think you've convinced yourself that you are fine with your name being under one of these things on this list, then you think you know better than God. And I fear for you. I fear for myself whenever I think I know more than God. To continue on in such things as envious, boastful, envying one another because we continue to harbor ill will in spite. Rather, beloved, let me end with this. Walk by the Spirit, whose fruit God desires, whose fruit God finds pleasing, whose fruit God will place in the hearts of his children. The fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Harbor those things in your heart. Trust in the God whose seed is true. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending us Christ, your Son, who not only died for our sins, but empowers us, has given us his righteousness so that we can bear the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, where they may be lacking in our lives, shore them up. Bring in a, a new harvest. Help us to find ways to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. If rather there are deeds of the flesh, one or many, Convict our hearts. Help us to, to walk with one another who may be suffering through these deeds of the flesh. Help us to support one another to move beyond and to mortify these sins, knowing that to love, to live, to desire those things is to forfeit an inheritance of heaven. So God, I pray that you help your church Help your church to love one another just as we love you. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.